<laughs> it's not changing a lot when it's starting. <laughs> it started, it started. Let's see. I can see how the yeah. number of participants is increasing. Yeah, let's hope. Okay, I will close my macro. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, third episode of the Medium for Discussions uh, webinar series. I'm Simone Deliberato and together with Vincenzo Giannini, I'll serve as host uh, for this event today. Just a few words of introduction. Uh, we decided to organize uh, the uh, MIDI webinar series to offer the different communities uh, working on Medium for Nanophotonics an opportunity to showcase results and foster collaborations. Before the pandemic, uh, we were working to organize a physical conference uh, specifically on phonon polaritons, so we decided to focus the first batch of speakers uh, on phonon polariton science and technology. According to the feedback we will receive and to the constantly evolving COVID-19 situation, we aim to then expand uh, the focus to other technological platforms such as intersuban polaritons uh, or medium infrared plasmonics. In this uh, third installment, we are honored to have uh, with us today Professor Thomas Stadner, who will give his talk uh, probing uh, ultra-confined and switchable surface phonon polaritons on bulk crystals uh, with near-field optical microscopy. Thomas has been professor at the RWTH Aachen University since 2009 after a postdoc at Stanford and he was the recipient of the Fraunhofer Attract Grant and the Returning Scientist Grant. Some practical information before leaving the virtual floor to Professor Tabner. The talk will last roughly 45 minutes followed by time for questions. In order to ask questions after the talk, you can use the Q&A button on the Zoom interface. You can either just write voice and I will unmute you and you will be able to ask your question yourself. Or if you prefer, you can write your question in full in the Q&A box and I will read your question aloud. Please note this webinar will be recorded and it could be shared online, including questions. Okay, I'm done. Please, Thomas. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot. Let me um, share with you my screen uh, for it. So now you should be able to see my slides. Uh, I will not go to the full screen because I want to also see the video of the colleagues and the participant list. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me for this webinar series. It's a great pleasure to contribute to this exchange in these uh, crazy times. And the title was already said, I will talk about ultra-confined and switchable surface phonopolaritons using Neffet optical microscopy. Looking in the audience, on the list of audience, I see some familiar names, which makes me very happy. Let's, I hope you also enjoy what I want to tell you. So the outline of my talk will be threefold. We will start, or I will start, with um, a basic introduction to phonon polaritons at near-field optical microscopy. And since this is kind of a webinar where I want to also introduce young students to the topic, I also will spend some historical notes on that. The main part, part two, will be about ultra-confined and switchable surface phonon polaritons, and I will enable this by using specific materials to change their optical properties. These are the so-called phase change materials, so you can optically write resonators and other nanostructures uh, in these surfaces. And last, I want to show you some recent results on probing the ultimate confinement of surface polaritons by really think, getting a very high field enhancement, enhancement and um, the local density of states in a, a small cavity, a metal hole cavity geometry. So let's start with surface polaritons. Um, you all might know from the recent talks that at the interface between a dielectric or a conductor or between positive or negative epsilon material, the surface wave can form as a solution of Maxwell's equations. And uh, the dispersion relation of the surface waves is given around here. 
and you have now different opportunities to fulfill a negative permittivity for the lower material. This could be for the case of a metal or a doped semiconductor, the lead to a surface plasma polariton, or if you have a polar crystal, then you can use the collective uh, crystal lattice vibrations of the phonons, and then you talk about a surface phonon polariton, which happens in um, a an, an polar crystal. Joshua Caldwell, I think last week, gave a very nice overview, and you also know where you talk about polaritons. Why should we now move to surface phonon polaritons and not stay with the surface plasma polaritons? So if you think about the optical properties of uh, polar crystals, you can nicely describe them with a single Lorentz oscillator. The dielectric function epsilon uh, is mainly positive, but within, in between the transverse optical phonon frequency and the longitudinal optical frequency, the permittivity is negative. So light is not allowed to enter this material. It rather decays exponentially, and most of it in the Farber experiment is reflected. And this spectral range here between the omega TO and the omega LO, this is the range where the polariton branch of the surface phonon polariton can exist. And there are many, many polar crystals that host these materials, or nitride, silicon carbide, quartz, and they happen at many different frequencies. Joshua gave a very nice overview last week, even in the far infrared. There are many industrial relevant materials like gallium arsenide, interpolar semiconductors that support surface phonon polaritons. And so what do they offer us? They have the advantage of giving us a sub-diffraction confinement. So that means the wave vector of the surface photopolariton is larger or much larger compared to the wave vector of free space. Here you can see the light line of free space. Compared to the surface plus polaritons due to the longer lifetime, we have lower optical losses and the spectral range is uh, limited between these two frequencies. But again, as I said, by choosing different materials, we can span a broad range of um, um, in different frequencies hosting these surface phonon polaritons. Now, usually if you talk about excitation of surface waves, since they are on the right of the light line, you cannot directly excite them by shining light on a plane surface. You need to somehow have a momentum matching. And usually this is done for surface plasmons in the Kretschmann configuration, where you have a prism with a high refractive index and total internal reflection, where you then can match the wave vector of the incident wave with the wave vector of the polariton propagating x direction. And if you have a bulk crystal, you cannot use this because this relies on a thin film geometry. But there is the Otto configuration, named after Andreas Otto, who passed away a couple uh, last year or two years ago, um, where you have an air gap between a prism and you can then couple to the surface polariton even on a bulk. So this is what people usually do in the far field. There's also a possibility for using gratings, and we heard two weeks ago by Jean-Jacques Griffé a very interesting talk about uh, gratings and how you can in and out couple collective uh, uh, phonon polaritons that also give rise to um, uh, coherent thermal emission. Today, I want to focus on the other two excitation schemes shown on the bottom left that you can excite or probe with the near-field optical microscope, or that you have a nanostructure that provides the high momentum needed for launching the polariton. So this is basically what we will be talking about. And the small particle is also a very nice example system to really compare now surface plasma polaritons with um, uh, uh, surface photon polaritons. It, you all might know the resonance condition for a small particle. If you are the quasi-static limit, you can describe the polarizability of a small particle made from a certain material with the permittivity epsilon with this formula. And you can see that in this formula, you have the epsilon of the particle minus the epsilon of the dielectric surrounding medium over the epsilon of the particle plus two times the epsilon of the dielectric medium. So there you see, if you have like a small particle, sub-wavelength dimensions, you will get a resonance if your epsilon of the particle is minus two times the environmental uh, epsilon. This is known as the Froelich condition, and this can be fulfilled by many different excitations. And for the plasmons, it's the collective electron vibrations in metals that uh, allow for getting resonances. And for the phonons, it's the collected lattice vibrations, the input frequencies. And just to show the difference between like the surface plasmon and the surface phonon polariton, we made many years ago with Ryder Hillenbrand together some calculations where we looked at the phonon polariton resonance of a silicon carbide nanoparticle, giving you a field enhancement which is enhanced like almost 30 times over the incident field. And if you compare this to that uh, of the conventional plasmonic resonances, by that time plasmonic nanoparticles had been very uh, popular. You see the gold resonance gives you only moderate enhancement. Silver is a little bit better, but you see already this resonance is much narrower, much sharper compared to the plasmonic resonances. 
And this uh, was also the way how we got into touch with service for polaritons. Um, in the early 2000s, we were doing Neefield microscopy and we were able to really map and spatially image this localized field enhancement, not a small nanoparticle, but at a polar crisp of silicon carbide. This is shown here in the bottom right, where you see an AFM topography image where the silicon carbide island is surrounded by a gold film. Any corresponding near field optical or SNOM image, you see um, a very high local field enhancement at the position where the silicon carbide is open. So it's much, much giving much, much higher field enhancement compared to the gold. This was also, I have to uh, be happy that this was also my very first publication in my scientific career, getting uh, at the first publication, second author nature was of course incredible. So we're really excited. Now I think I need to tell you what is Neefield microscopy if you want to use this method for probing polaritons. So let me first um, start with conventional optics. If you come in with light and image like a boundary of two materials, you will have a diffraction limit resolution so you cannot resolve sharp features which are smaller than lambda over two. This changes if you now bring a tip in your illuminating uh, light path. This tip can act as a lighting rod and at its sharp rates of curvature, a metallic tip acts like a lightning rod and locally enhances the field. And this strongly enhanced near fields, they are bound to the diameter of the tip radius. So therefore, this locally enhanced field around the tip gives you the resolution. And you can think about this, that these uh, fields that are occurring at the tip now depend on the material under study. So the left material might have different optical properties compared to the right material. And if these have different optical properties, you might expect some optical contrast. This is basically what Neefield microscopy is usually doing. You probe material contrasts. This is one thing where this is basically uh, useful, this method, but it's also useful for probing electrical fields. So if you think about nanostructures, I will show you this uh, later on, that have a locally enhanced field, the Neefield optical microscope would also be capable of measuring these locally enhanced fields, even if it's the same material. So these are the two ways how you can use the Neefield optic microscopy and we will have examples for both in the future of this talk. So let me briefly also show you how such a Neefield optic microscope works or how this is set up. Um, we call it a scattering type, scanning Neefield optic microscopy. This is used to distinguish it from the earlier type where people use apertures, which we don't do nowadays. The aperture less type gives you a much higher, uh, higher signal. So you start with a laser light source then we have a beam splitter which transmits half of the beam. You focus this with a diffraction limited optics onto the tip. The AFM tip, uh, the tip is usually also part of an atomic force microscope um, and you use this in the tapping mode. So you have your tip oscillating up and down and therefore you can image the topography of your surface. But it is an oscillation up and down of the tip. This also is needed to get the signal from, the tip, from below the tip and discriminated from the background fields that are all around over the sample. Remember, the focusing spot is diffraction limited, so it's much larger than the tip size, and therefore we need some modulation and demodulation techniques to really extract the signal from below the tip. Now, the light scattered that is doing this tip sample interaction is collected by the same optics and via the beam splitter sent into the detector. What we also do in near-field optical microscopy, we use the second arm of this beam splitter, it's like a Michelson interferometer. And here we can control the properties of a reference beam. And by doing this, we can detect not only the amplitude or intensity of the scattered light, but we're able to separate the, um, the, uh, the scattered light in terms of amplitude and phase. So what we use here, we use a locket amplifier, and this is not operating only at the oscillation frequency, large omega, it's, either, uh, it's even a higher harmonic of that. And this allows to suppress the background because the background would only give us linear contributions where the higher harmonic demodulation here on the exponential decay signal gives us uh, also higher harmonics. So if we summarize this, we can get a sub wavelength resolution. And the good thing is, since we don't use any aperture or any waveguides, we can use reflecting optics. So you can use it for all kinds of wavelengths and the resolution only depends on how sharp your tip is. And as I told you before, we can measure both amplitude and phase. Now, in order to understand how this interaction works, I want to go through with you through a very simple model, a simple model of dipolar needle interaction. This is not the most sophisticated model, but it's very intuitive to understand how the Neefeld microscopy works. 
and why we can probe both material properties and local fields. So in this approximation, the whole tip is replaced by a single spherical nanoparticle with a certain polarizability alpha. Remember the formula for a small particle resonance in the electrostatic regime. This is basically what we use to describe the tip properties. And then we employ the method of image charges to, inter, uh, to calculate the interaction with a flat sample surface with a certain permittivity epsilon. This permittivity can be a complex value quantity. And now we can couple our tip dipole with its image dipole. And if we do this, we get a distance dependent polarizability for the whole system of tip dipole and image dipole. This we call effective polarizability. And this also depends on the sample properties by this factor called beta. And here in this beta, it's basically the reflection coefficient of the sample, but it's also uh, applicable for larger k-vectors. You see epsilon minus one over epsilon plus one. And you can already see maybe also in the surface there could be some resonances, and this will end up to be like the resonance condition for surface uh, polaritons. If we have this the distance dependence polarizability, we can calculate this for different height c of the tip above the sample. We can also describe the modulation and the demodulation by sinusoidally moving the tip. We can ex express the background suppression. We don't do this for now. And what is more important is we can also describe the scattered light because the light scattered from this particle plane surface junction is just proportional to the effective polarizability times the incident field. So we can see the local field here times the effective polarizability is proportional to what is scattered. Of course, the overall amount of scattered light will be wrong because a small particle scatters much less light compared to a big or elongated shaft, but it's good for describing the contrast between two sample materials which are right next to each other. So for contrast, this is quite well. Now, if we evaluate the scattering contrast as a function of the permittivity of the sample material, you can now put in different materials, different frequencies here. You can see, for example, metals in the visible light have a slightly negative permittivity. Metals in the infraspectral range have like minus 5,000, so they get a lower scattering amplitude. The semiconductors have a high positive permittivity. They give you intermediate scattering amplitude. And polymers give you a very low uh, scattering amplitude due to a low refractive index. But you also see the solid lines here. They are calculated now for a varying real part. And you can see there's a resonance up here for small negative values. So in this geometry of the tip and the sample system, we can get resonances either via the tip or via the sample. And for an epsilon, which is small and negative, you also expect very high signals. And this was also the way how I came across the surface phonon polaritons, because um, we wanted to do near field microscopy. We wanted to investigate different materials and you want to have high signals and high contrast. So we're looking for something that can give you such a resonance, also infrared frequencies. And this also was the motivation uh, for us in the group of um, Fritz Keimer and Rainer Hillenbrand in the early 2000s. We want to use the spectroscopic information that comes along with infrared light and combine with the nanoscale resolution of scattering type near optical microscopy. And the infrared spectral range is quite rich of fundamental excitations. You can excite free charge carriers and doped semiconductors. And here you can see the permittivity, which also becomes slightly negative, so you expect a resonance popping up, popping up here. You can use optical phonons between the TO and the LO phonon frequency. You also get negative permittivity, so you can expect high signals. And also you can probe molecular vibrations, which is not uh, part of today's talk, but this is all of the classical standard infrared fingerprint spectroscopy if you want to distinguish different species. And this is actually also was one of the topics of my PhD thesis to really perform spectroscopy on molecular vibrations and figure out how we can bring the power of spectroscopy towards nanoscale and get some fingerprint spectra. All right, so this was the overview and the motivation for using mid-infrared light. Let's now switch to the phonon polaritons. And if you look at the crystal silicon carbide, it's really a textbook example uh, of a single uh, phonon resonance material. So down here, you see the permittivity in real part and imaginary part, the real part in the solid line. And you can see between the TO and the LO frequency, your permittivity, the real part becomes negative. It's actually becoming negative here and here. This will have two crossing points. However, close to the uh, TO optical frequency, the imaginary part is very high. So you would not expect to see a resonance around here. 
So what does it mean if the permittivity is negative? It means that a wave, a plane wave, cannot penetrate the material. It's rather reflected. And this you can see by a high reflectivity in the spectral range, which is called Reststrahl region or Reststrahl band. So in between uh, these two frequencies, silicon carbide is almost a perfect mirror, just like gold, you have enhanced high perfect reflectivity. If we now use the near-field optical microscope, the spectral response changes dramatically. You can describe this with the chemical response of a small spherical particle above the surface. And here, you end up with a very sharp resonance. And look at the numbers here compared to gold, which is invisible light plasmonic material and scatters a lot of light. You would expect to have an intensity which is enhanced by 50 or 70 times. So there should be indeed a very strongly confined near field resonance on a polar crystal like silicon carbide. And this is exactly what we could measure uh, together with Rainer Hildenbrand and Fritz Keilmann. We investigated this silicon carbide crystal. We covered uh, this partially with a gold film. And then we imaged this in a near field microscope at a frequency which is close to resonance, where you get a 14 times enhanced amplitude over gold. And if you just slightly tune, the frequency away from the resonance, silicon carbide is much darker compared to the gold. So the pictures here are normalized to the values of the gold, which has a constant reflectivity in the infrared. And you can see there's a huge dynamics. And to trace this out for many different frequencies, you will get a resonant response. This is taken from our original publication. And this is a logarithmic scale. So within only a few tens of wave numbers, the signal changes by orders of magnitude. So you really get a very strong and highly sensitive resonance because the tip couples now to the material and this coupling is enhanced by the collective um, um, phonon oscillations below the tip. So let me give you a small side note, which is also important for the younger students. So how, why did we start with silicon carbide? We could say, oh, we, we have been in touch with Jean-Jacques Grefe and know about the thermal emission, or we knew all the textbooks. The reality was much simpler, and I hope I don't get this wrong. If Rainer and Fritz are around, please apologize me if I, I tell this in the wrong way. So if I remember correctly, we were searching for materials that are in the range of small negative permittivity in the range of our lasers. So what Rainer did by that time, he looked into the textbook, absorption scattering by light of light by small particles by Braun and Huffman, and he went through the later chapters. And in one of the chapters, there was an example of lattice vibrations where the permittivity of silicon carbide was uh, plotted, and it really says a solid for which this one oscillator model fits extremely well is alpha silicon carbide. This is a textbook example. Also, it also has technological importance. So what my take home message here is to the young students, don't only read the papers that have been coming out over the last two or 10 years, go for some textbooks, understand the physics, and then you will find uh, systems that can help you and people have not been considered. So that's the first take home message for the younger students and how we came across the silicon carbide. Of course, um, if you have such a strong resonance, you can now use it for imaging. And the cool thing is now everything that changes the local phonon properties also has a tremendous influence on your leaf field coupling. So the local crystallinity matters. And this was shown, for example, by Neon Ocelic by doing ion implantation on a silicon carbide crystal, a checkerboard pattern can really see how you can resolve different areas where you have different crystal quality. Also, the spectrum is dampened around here. You can look at different polytypes, depending on how silicon carbide uh, crystals are stacked upon each other. You will get slightly different phonon response. You can see this in the spectrum. You can see the imaging. You can apply strain to your material, like doing an indent on it. And you can see compressive and tensile strain and really do the spatially resolve. This is an example of Andreas Huber. And doing this also in the group of Rainer Hilbert. So you can use now the photopolarities for the imaging, and you can also image propagating surface photopolarities. And this was first published by Andreas Huber. In this example, you can see in topography an edge between a gold, crystal, gold film and a silicon carbide crystal. And here you see the images over a big range, the scale bar is 20 micron, taken at different frequencies of the CO2 laser. And you can see that the fringe spacing of these propagating waves is changing. And you have waves launched at the edge, as you can see in the sketch down here. And these waves propagate, and the field is being picked up by the tip. So what you basically see here is interference phenomenon between the direct illumination of your tip and the field launched at the edge and the polariton propagating along this. And if you model this the right way, you can actually extract 
the dispersion relation of the surface for a prioriton in real space. Now, this seems to be slightly different from what I told you before, how this norm would work. So therefore, let's get back to like the, the operation principle of an even optical microscope. So we start with the instant field, E with the index I, you illuminate your tip and your sample with some field. Now, you can think about this field at an edge, at a, at a, at a small nanoparticle and so on. It is converted to like high spatial frequency fields that can also launch a polariton. Think about a particle launching polariton or an edge of a nanowire launching a surface plasma on, on a nanowire. So therefore, if you now look which field happens at the position of the tip, which can also scan around here, you have the incident field of the illuminating laser plus the field created by the polariton. This is the local field, and this local field illuminates the tip. And of course, if you now scan the tip, this local field changes, whether you're a maximum or a minimum of the polariton interference, and therefore you can now get these pictures that we saw on the last slide. And the scattered light is still proportional to this effective polarizability that I mentioned, so the interaction between the tip and the sound material. However, this doesn't change if you have a spatially invariant sample, it's all the same silicon carbide. So what you measure in this mode when you have propagating polaritons is the change of the local field at the position of the tip. So the sum of the instant field and the field created by the surface wave is measured and we use for polariton imaging the SNOM now here for probing um, the electric fields. All right, and here's another um, side note about polariton circuits and how you can modify them, how you can electrical voltage, you can try to shut them on and off. So this is from an um, overseen or often overlooked paper by 2004 by Rainer Hillenbrand. You can see him here. He was uh, getting awarded a research group in Germany, a nanocouture research group. Where he hired, for example, Andreas Huber or uh, Nenad Ocilic, uh, Dimitri Karsantsev. And they were all working on polaritons. And he was making a paper to distinguish it from like the surface plus and polaritons. And he basically said, all the cool stuff that you can do with surface plasmons, you can also do in the infrared and you might be even able to do it better. Uh, and this he called phonon photonics. And here's a graph from the picture uh, from his paper where he had like a surface polariton, then some kind of modulator, some electric wires, near field probe for scattering it out. So this concept, he was way ahead of time and it somehow got almost forgotten because uh, everybody was focusing on plasmonics, on, on chips, on chip uh, data, um, 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 data manipulation and so on. Anyway, um, the, um, this was basically the early days of the surface photopolaritons. In the year 2002, we showed the Neofit resonance. In the same year, it was Jean-Jacques Griffet uh, bringing out his work about narrowband thermal emission. And then later year on, one year later, was Yannick de Wilde measuring it with a Neofit optical microscope, the thermal emission. And then this field got more or less silent. Until the 2010s, and was basically Joshua Caldwell popping up into the scene and made nanostructures out of silicon carbide. And this was not a trivial task because if you want to modify them, you some have problems with crystalline quality. Bad crystalline quality would dampen the resonances, but he was the first one to manage really edge high quality factor resonances uh, in the silicon carbide, these nanopillars, where got quality factors in the order of 40 to 135. If you compare this to plasmonics, it's much more narrow. Plasmonics would only give you like quality factors in a few, few tens, maybe. We also had a contribution uh, with a postdoc by that time, Tao Wang, where we looked at a very simple geometry. And this is what I want to talk about next. It's about uh, the spherical hole resonated geometry. And this is quite simple because you don't need any etching steps. Anybody can do this at home with a thermal evaporator and some nanospheres to do this. You just put a nanosphere of a certain size onto the substrate of choice evaporate metal, remove the nanosphere, then you get a circular cavity. And this is the cross section here of this cavity. It's basically a gold covered silicon carbide crystal. And once you uh, uh, make this fabrication, this resonance frequency is fixed. But it's a very nice system and very instructive. We, in, we investigated this in, in 2013. So if we, when we investigated this first, we went to the far field experiment to a Fourier transform infrared spectrometer. And the far field, we found this response here for different diameters. You see there's a big dip in the reflectance and there's also a small narrow dip in here. And if we take a look at the optical properties of silicon carbide, we will find that there's a region where we have um, a both um, a negative and a positive um, permittivity. 
depending on whether you are above or below uh, the phone frequencies. And we found out that these two resonances have two different origins. The big one, the broad one, actually on the left, that's actually a resonance of the hole in the metal film. If you think about Barbinet's principle, you can describe the optical properties by the inverse structure. You know, a gold disc has a resonance, also a gold film will have a resonance. So this one stems from a plasmonic-like slot antenna resonance where the field is high on the metal. The small dip, however, according to the simulations, would be a resonance of surface phonopolitons that are now, um, well, localized in the small cavity and can only bounce back and forth. So we also tried to measure these very high Q resonance uh, in an FTR, and we used this very special uh, objective that allowed for grazing incidence. In a grazing incidence, the electric field is per polarized only perpendicular to the surface, like I show with my fingers here. So therefore, the plasmonic resonance that's only oscillated in plane is no longer excited. But the surface polariton can be excited at the edges, and indeed, we were able to find a very narrow band resonance um, in the regime of the negative permittivity, which also slightly shifts with a certain diameter. And if you calculate or evaluate the Q factor of this, we'll get Q factors in the order of like 60 to 70 for various diameters. And if you compare this to the plasmonic resonances, you only would get Q factors in the order of 10. So basically here in the far field with very simple methods, we can nicely distinguish between the surface phonon polariton resonances and the resonance in the metallic surround. We also um, were doing some uh, scaling. So how do these two resonances scale with increasing diameter of the spherical particles? So you see that there's a strong inference for the slot-like, for the plasmonic resonance, and for the surface phonon polariton, we figured out that there should be actually two different modes that are excited. Uh, they are both at different diameters, um, you can see here, but they, they don't change a lot in frequency because the, 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 the wavelength range, the resonance wavelength was given by our lasers. We didn't have so many tunable lasers by that time, uh, but we could actually see those. And the question is, is it true? Are these really two different modes that we see here? And indeed, by using the scanning near field optical microscope, the SNOM, we could image both a three micron diameter hole on the silicon carbide and a six micrometer diameter hole. If we go for the three micrometer hole, you can see there is a strong or there's a, a bright signal on the silicon carbide. And we also did this with different tips. In the near field optical microscope, you can change the strength of the coupling between the tip and the polariton by changing the material of the tip. A metallic tip is more prominent to launch the, uh, or interact with the sample than a dielectric tip, which is basically more or less not only probing. And here you can see one single bright spot, which is rather broad. And this is in accordance with the finite difference time domain simulations. The phase profile should be uniform. And if we go to the larger diameter, the six micrometer hole, we saw two bright lobes on the bottom right and the top right. This is due to our illumination direction, which comes from the bottom left. And if you do this also with the silicon tip, which is less interacting, you would also see a similar pattern. So it's really a pattern from the polaritons. And this also agrees reasonably well with the finite difference time domain simulations. And what is also nice, you can also see that these two fields are op uh, opposite sign as you can derive from the phase, from the phase measurement in the near field optical microscope. So the near field optical microscope allows you to give you uh, the reveal you the mode structure and also show the spatial confinement of this resonator geometry. And this was already a couple of years ago. I have to mention that recently there came out a very nice paper who did the same stuff on Bohr nitride. This was done by Xiaoxiu Zhu, um, former postdoc of um, the group uh, of Dimitri Basov, now professor by himself. And they also looked at the spherical disk geometry. This was a disk made from a Bohr nitride with a diameter, I think it was six micron. And here he saw also uh, in different heights uh, for different frequencies, a very interesting mode structure. It's a very similar pattern. But the cool thing is here, he made a very detailed analysis and could really show how if you change like the confinement, the momenta, uh, the geometry, that you have only discrete modes around. And this is shown here by the step-like function where you have even higher order modes or not. So he was doing this in a much more uh, sophisticated way. Okay, so this uh, was the end of the first part. Now we've seen that you can actually confine polaritons and you get a nice Q factor, but you don't gain a lot in terms of confinement the structures that I showed you were all many microns in diameter and not truly nanoscale. 
And now in the second part, I want to show you how you can use um, a crystal that supports surface polarities. And by adding a switchable material where you can change the dielectric properties, these are the phase change materials, then you can make them more confined and you can also switch them on and off. So the high confinement here comes from the high diffractive index of those materials and the switching comes because the materials have two stable states. These phase change materials, how they are called, they might be familiar to the olders of you who are still like burning CDs when they had their own personal computer. Like in the back in the early 90s, 2000s, you could really get rewritable CDs and DVDs. These phase change materials were used there because they show a very strong change in optical and electric contrast when switched between the morphs and the crystal phase. And both phases are stable at room temperature. People nowadays also want to use them for data storage in uh, computer memories because they're non-volatile, so you don't need, and they're very fast, so you don't need to wait for your computer to power up. Everything would be already stored in your memory and it's kept in this position even if you switch it off. Now we use specific phase chain materials with properties in the infrared spectral range that show both a very high refractive index. It's called germanium antimony telluride with the composition three to six. In the amorphous state, you can see here the optical properties over the mid infrared spectral range. You can now use an optical pulse and electrical pulse or just T to transfer them to the crystalline state. With optical and electrical pulse, you can also switch them back to the amorphous state. And here you can see the optical properties in, in the mid infrared spectral range. You see there's a huge change in real part and the imaginary part keeps rather low. So we get a, a change in epsilon of more than 24. So this is a huge change in permittivity, right? And we have very small absorption loss. The imaginary part is very small compared to the real part. And now the idea was to cover your phonon hosting material, in this case a quartz crystal, with a thin layer of phase change material, and then induce either an amorphous spot and a crystal matrix, or induce a crystalline spot in a amorphous matrix by shooting and switching it with a laser. So this laser switching, you can think about like in a CD player, you have a laser that uh, below the rotating, uh, that uh, puts in individual dots in here. We do the same thing with a home built setup. We can change the pulse length and the power. You can see here the laser diet, which is basically transferred over a couple of mirrors to an objective. And here's the sample. And we use a, a very small spot size of about one or two micron. And we can really precisely now put individual spots if you use long and low power spots, we crystallize the material. If you use short and high power spot uh, pulses, we amorphize the material. And here you see an AFM image of such spots written in the GST film on top of a quartz crystal. You can see here there is some debris around the area, uh, but in topography, there's not a lot of change. If we now use the Neffert optical microscope to probe the dielectric response, so outside the restaurant ba band where the quartz has a positive permittivity, you can see that indeed here, the amorphous spots, they show a smaller uh, snom signal compared to the crystalline surrounding. And if you recrystallize them, there is no optical contrast between the spots and the surrounding. And the cool stuff now happens if you go to frequencies where the, the, uh, the quartz is now uh, a fo service phonon polarity hosting material with negative permittivity. Here you see for the amorphous spots, very high signal, and if we change the frequency, you can also see fringes moving in inside these spots and give us a very high signal. In order to prove that these are really propagating surface polaritons, we also wrote more extended structures like this V-shaped structure in here. You can nicely see the dielectric contrast. And if you go to two frequencies where surface phonon polaritons are excited, you can see at the edges of the boundary, there are fringes around. You can see here to zoom in. And you can also see that depending on the frequency, these fringes now have a different pattern. So the SNOM is now used for the real space mapping of propagating surface polar polaritons. And the cool thing is in here now, the scale bar here is now one micron. So you get a much, much higher confinement. Uh, this is illuminated at 9.7 micron wavelengths. So we really get a strong confinement of more than 10 times up to 20 times of the real space wave vector in these small polaritons. So what you can do is you can also model this. I don't want to go into detail because time is already quite advanced uh, for this. We can maybe discuss later on. And you can then uh, reconstruct the dispersion relation. And here you can see the dispersion relation for different thicknesses of the phase change layer on top of the quartz crystal. And the nice thing is now if you decrease the thickness from 30 to 50 to 7 nanometers, your confinement increases. So we get 70 times 
the polariton wave factor compared to the free space wave factor. And if we switch the properties to the crystal one, for the crystal GST, the imaginary part is slightly lower. You would theoretically get even higher values, but your resonance shifts here, and uh, usually you get uh, then a little bit lower confinement from that. So we also were looking at individual resonators, and again, we went back to the far field, to the FTRR measurement, where we plotted an, an array of dots inside the matrix, and we saw in the measurement, indeed, there is, depending on whether we have the long or the short spot size, you get a more or less strong resonance. For the, for the long um, axis, we found a, a higher order mode here. That's why it's um, a broad, um, a not so uh, deep resonance. And for the polarization along the short axis, we found a deep and very narrow band resonance, which agrees nicely with simulations. And what we could do is, we could do this writing and erasing multiple times you can see here the reflectance change and the resonance that is here with the Q factor of like 95 can be completely switched off, as you can see here by the dashed lines and switched on again multiple times. And that's the nice thing. The same is also true for the other axis. So I showed you that you now using the phase change material and uh, the phonopolarton host material can write and erase resonant nanostructures, you get high Q resonances, and you can get a significant amount of cycles. Here we avoided the use of a capping layer, which then led to degradation, but you can also add a capping layer. Then, of course, non groping is a little bit more difficult, but I can you also imagine that you can do more cycles in this um, probing. So let me summarize now the second part here. Um, I showed you that if you now put a thin film of a high index material on top of a, um, a bulk crystal that hosts surface polaritons, you get ultra confined waves. And physically, you can also understand this because you introduce a dielectric boundary, which is only a couple of nanometers high. So therefore, the confinement comes from the geometry, basically, because you have a, a step between a high dielectric function and low dielectric function. This compresses your polaritons. I showed you the reversible switching, how you can assign resonance modes or the polariton dispersion with a near optical microscope. I also want to mention that by adding the thin layer, um, you can also get a very high confinement. It's in the range of that what you get on two-dimensional materials. We have a thin layer of a phonon polariton or plasma polariton material, like in graphene or power nitride, you get similar um, results. And this was also picked up by Alexander Brofkin, who also saw the audience later on. He used a two-dimensional material and put it onto a phone resin substrate to get a record high um, confinement. So now I only have a few minutes left, so I will be rather quick with the third topic that I want to share with you. Uh, I also, but let me also get uh, some, other, some outlook. This writing and erasing of structures is something that we now use for creating arbitrary meta surfaces or meta materials. Uh, so we made quite nice progress in uh, improving our setup and write arbitrary resonant nanostructures. You can also think about coating thin layers at the top and the bottom and improve the super lensing or switch everything. And also we saw last week in the talk, um, by Josh Caldwell that he could use for nitride and vanadium dioxide for make programmable and switchable meta surfaces. So we already covered this topic quite a lot. So let me now go back to the very simple uh, metal circular cavity and now try to push it to the limits for confinement in terms of surface waves. And this was a project carried out by a visiting postdoc, Hisashi Sumikura from the Nippon Telegraph Company. He was there for one or two years in my lab and we were able to look at this. So the motivation was that if you want to inter have a nice strong interaction of light with nanoscale matter, you need to bring the mode volume down. And usually what people do for enhancing light matter interaction is they put the molecule in the cavity, a resonant cavity, like a dielectric cavity or laser cavity. This is what people used to do. But we can also try to make cavities for surface phonopolaritons. We can use the high wave factor and the localized field to create sub-wavelength cavities. So there has been a lot of work in, in plasmonics using nanorods for this or a very nice quality uh, single crystal flakes where people have been surface plasma polarities focused on. The nanopillars of Joshua Kelp were an example. Bar nitride nanorods give you a high confinement and so on. And we also showed this for the GST. And now we want to focus on a very simple system for the end, for the last five minutes or so. A system which consists of a silicon carbide crystal, which gives us high quality surface phonopolaritons, a thin layer of a phase change material, and then to define the cavity, you don't want to etch 
our this interior, we just use the nanosphere lithography again and cover it with a gold film with a circular hole. And here we use much smaller holes than before because the polaritons, due to the thin dielectric layer of GST, they're already much more confined, so we can go to smaller cavity sizes. So in order to prove that we really still have propagating polaritons, uh, Hisashi imaged the propagation of polaritons at a gold edge, and you can see here the fringes. We can use this for extracting the, the dispersion by taking images at different frequencies, uh, ma uh, mapping the k-vector, we get a dispersion. And interesting here, we are in the frequency range where we get a negative dispersion. So that's uh, something nice. And you see the confinement here. We have already a 20-fold increasement compared to the silicon carbide, which is almost here at the light line at these frequencies. So this confinement is strongly increased by adding the thin dielectric layer. And we still get a propagation length in the order of, uh, order of a micrometer. So it might work to confine this into a cavity and bounce it back and forth again. And the nice thing is compared to the plain silicon carbide system by this thin dielectric layer, we've got a huge increase in our wave factor. So Hisashi fabricated his cavities and did its non-imaging at different frequencies. And you can see already, you can see uh, here uh, for uh, um, very short, uh, for, for low frequencies, there are some fringes. And now if you increase the frequency, which corresponds to, call, to a longer wavelength in free space um, of, um, 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 no, sorry. Here you can see a fringe pattern. And if you, uh, if you now uh, increase the frequency, you can see here there's actually a single peak. These are the line profiles, where for a cavity of 1.5 micro, 5.9 micrometer diameter, you get a strong field in half of 912 uh, wave numbers. So he did this for uh, different cavities of different sizes, 0.6 micrometer, 1 micrometer, and 1.9 micrometer, always finding the spot where there's only a single peak in here. And you can see here, the single peak can be narrowed down to the full width at half maximum of 220 nanometer. Also, the laser has a wavelength of 9 point something micron. So this corresponds to lambda over 50 confinement in both dimensions, and there are no side lobes to it. You can also plot uh, the field concentration as a function of frequency if you look at the cavity center. And then you can see that, for example, for the one micrometer diameter, you get a higher frequency, a higher field enhancement factor, but you also get decent field enhancements for uh, the larger and the smaller cavity. Now, we also did some calculations for modeling it. I don't want to go into detail. Since this is a spherical geometry, you can basically get a fundamental equation where you have to solve some Bessel functions for the propagation back and forth. And therefore, you can basically have only a phase jump upon reflection. And this phase jump can vary depending on how high your gold edge is. But within this range of plus or minus pi over 2, we get a nice agreement in this range. Um, that's the detail. And what is also very cool about using the phase chain material is you can now change the properties from a low index to a higher index. And in this case, this higher index switches the resonance out of our frequency range or our laser. So we can completely switch this nanoscale field enhancement and off. So we have very small spots, hot spots, we can use for sensing molecules, for interaction for having enhanced light matter interaction that are also switchable and tunable. Um, you also know that sometimes if you have the molecular light interaction, you talk about like mode volume. In this case, we talk more about the mode area because the Z extent with the slum, we determine by our probing mechanism. We can change the tapping parameters to have smaller or shorter decay. So we just restricted ourselves to mode area. And Hisashi calculated this mode area and he came uh, up to a minimal mode area of the free space wavelength squared divided over 3000 at the diameter of 0.6 micrometer and the wavelength of 11.22 micrometer. If you compare this with conventional cavities like photonic crystal cavities, you only get lambda squared over 10. So it's because it's lambda over diffractive index squared. And here we have a much stronger confinement and therefore a much, much smaller mode area, not volume in this case. And also, what is not in the paper, but we did, we looked for the smallest cavity size where a single hotspot could occur. And he came up with a cavity of 0.36 micrometer diameter with a very thin GST film. Seven, eight nanometer was the thinnest film we had. And here again, he got um, full width of maximum of only 210 nanometers of this hotspot. And if you calculated the mode um, 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 area, it was lambda squared over 4,000. 
So it's really getting with a really, really huge confinement. Also, we don't use the two-dimensional materials. So this, let me summarize the third and last part. I showed you that you can get also for enhanced light matter interaction cavities that are simple to, un to describe, simple to fabricate with an exceptionally small mold volume or mold um, area where you can get lambda over 50 or 220 nanometer uh, hotspots. And you can switch this on and off. And I also want uh, to um, mention a recent work by Alexander Dubrovkin, I think he's also in the audience, where he used the same principle of having a thin dielectric film, but he made some uh, nanostructures made of a thin germanium film on top of a silicon carbide. And you can see here the scale bar 300 nanometers, and he even managed to get a peak with lambda over 235. So that's really a huge confinement. And he also gets some side lobes. So for sensing, this might be not the best solution, but it's also a very nice system. It makes me very proud to see that this concept is being picked up in the community and people really work on highly confined surface polaritons, not only in 2D materials, but in bulk materials with very thin two-dimensional layers. So with this, I'm at the end of my talk. So I want to stay roughly in time. Here you see an infrared image of my former group. You can see very hot uh, people in here, like this one's very hot and this one's very hot. You can see short or long pants and so on. Um, the people who did this work are mainly former PhD students and postdocs, especially I want to mention Pai Ning Li, who is now a professor in China, Tao Wang, who is also a professor in China now, Hisashi Sumikura, our visiting postdoc, many of my PhD students, Matthias Wuttig for the phase shift materials, and the earlier work was performed in the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry in the group of Fritz Keilmann and in the group of Rainer Hillenbrand. Um, Andy Huber, uh, Neat Otrich, and Dimitri Gassansev were also the key people who contributed to the Polaritum work in the early 2000s. Yeah, with this, I'm at the end of this webinar and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Thomas, for uh, the great talk. Uh, by the way, I took uh, my, my version of the Boren and the Huffman. So this is really the reason for which you actually use the uh, silicon carbide. This Good, is how uh, I remember it. Uh, you have to ask Fritz Keilmann or Rainer Hildenbrand whether this is really true, but my version is like this. Good, good trivia, though. Uh, okay, uh, now it's time for question. I'll... Uh, Remember uh, you the um, how it works. Uh, either you write voice uh, and I let you ask the question, or you write your question in full and I read it. Please note that uh, I, if you want your name to be uh, read, just write it uh, inside the question. So uh, I will start with. Uh, I have a question to start with. Uh, we have been recently working uh, with studying uh, non-local effects in uh, in phonon polaritons uh, we we had a prx recently and uh, on archive now we put a, a work in which we study the limit of field enhancement uh, in uh, some relevant geometry uh, of course you have metals uh, in your uh, resonator so it's difficult uh, to go too small uh, what's the limit can you actually can you actually get uh, because uh, I see uh, Jeremy Bamber works uh, on uh, oh. pico cavities with uh, with gold nanosphere. Is it possible to go the same direction oh. for to do extremely small cavities for phonon polaritons using metals? Okay, so let me you mentioned Jeremy Baumberg and how to make ultra small cavities. So what we were investigating was propagating polaritons in the surface that bounce back and forth. So yep. basically what is an in-plane cavity, uh, so to speak. And what Jeremy Baumberg did for dating doing these pico cavities, he used the metal insulator metal gap size below a spherical particle. Yep. And I see actually uh, if we have the right material, like a two-dimensional material, where we also have the phonons out of plane, not only in plane, I would see no reason why one should not be able to make such a cavity for phonon polaritons as well. The question is, how collective would you still be? So um, with the concept of the in-plane, um, I think you will basically have the same problems like people have when they do graphene resonators. At some point, if you make your resonator smaller and smaller, the edge modes actually will play an important role. We have like zigzag or armchair uh, terminated graphene. And the same would also, I expect, to hold true then for uh, polaritons if you have them really on very small two-dimensional flakes. 
And the beauty of the approach that also um, Alexander Dubrovkin was taking um, here, I didn't go into detail, is he can little fact graphically uh, very precisely um, um, add a very thin dielectric material um, where the crystalline quality of the underlying material can be almost perfect. So this dielectric boundary offers, I think, a very good way for in-play, but I don't think that you will get to the pico cavity. For this pico cavity stuff, I guess we have to probably look at a, transver uh, at a transversal direction. Yeah, thank you for the very interesting answer. And indeed, with, even without going to the pico cavities, I think uh, you can go small enough uh, to actually start seeing uh, non-local effects and propagating uh, propag propagative effects. Okay, uh, let's go to the... Uh, First question from the public, which is from uh, Alexander Dubrovnik, uh, who you just uh, mentioned. Uh, how quality factors of a cavity measured via near field and far field FTIR are related? Okay, that's a difficult one because the two systems that I showed, in one, the last one by Hisashi, we only used um, uh, near field uh, quality factors. The reason was, we don't have a synchrotron in here and these cavities were so small that we couldn't do far field experiments on them. So the far field experiments we could only do on larger cavities of many microns diameter, so we don't have this comparison of the quality factors. One potential way of doing so would be to use lithography and create many identical, very small resonators to be able to have enough signal for a far field experiment, but we haven't done this in this geometry that he's asking for. Okay, uh, next question uh, on slide 22. Mm -hmm. Can we use normal incidence to probe in plane uh, phonon polaritons of silicon carbide cavity? What are the benefits of using uh, grazing angle over normal incidence uh, in uh, phonon polaritons case? Yeah. Thank you for knowledgeable lecture. Okay, very, very good question. So this is about like, how, which modes do you excite under which um, incident angle and polarization. So um, you can see already here for the normal incidence, I have to admit in the classical FTRI, people use um, mirror objectives, cast a great objective, and you always come in off the normal. So unless you do very special requirements, you will always have a component in plane. So you cannot really control what you would get from like FTD simulations. You have to take this into account. So there's always an in plane uh, component in there. But here you can see the resonance is still observable, but you also see it almost overlaps with the broad, broad plasmonic resonance. And our main idea was to really switch off the plasmonic resonance by coming in a grazing incidence to only see the, uh, the, the resonance in, um, uh, in, in, uh, of the surface phonon polaritons. And of course, um, what actually a good, a good, it's a very good question because uh, one could think about like the symmetry of the fields and you could be able to play around in, 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 in exciting certain orders of the modes where the field is pointing the same direction at both ends of the cavity or in opposite directions. And this is something that you should be able to uh, see a difference if you can have the right uh, cavity diameter and the right angle of incidence. So this would be the answer that you could play around with symmetry depending you have the same excitation on both sides or you have a different excitation. Okay, uh, is there any other question? Let's wait a few seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, why there is a blue shift of the frequency when the size of the hole in the top metallization is increased in the last geometry? Yes, okay, so I was, I was quite quick on this. I have to apologize. I was trying to stick roughly in time. And you so did. the reason for this was if you take a look at the dispersion, usually people operate here on this branch of the dispersion that you have a positive uh, dispersion. But here we are, are looking, uh, we, are at we are at frequencies above. So we have negative dispersion. And this means actually that we get um, indeed uh, this uh, blue shift as mentioned in the question. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. Okay, questions? So usually one would think about like increasing frequency would give you a higher K, but here the increasing frequency gives you a lower K, and that means we also get a different uh, diameter of the cavity. 
Let's wait a few seconds uh, if anyone want to type a very long and complex question. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, Alex Parman want to ask a question himself. So I'll, okay. Uh, Alex, you appear twice in the list, so uh, I'm giving voice to one of you. Try. <laughs> Was it right, Alexander Parman, or? <laughs> uh, I tried with the other one. Okay, yes. I think it works now. Now you can hear you. Yes, okay, sorry, I had some problems with VPN. So, my question, and it was too long to type, um, have you looked into, thinking of this pico cavity, uh, if you, put two of those cavities close to each other and get some strong coupling between neighboring cavities. Uh, because I think this is sort of a nice playground. Yes. yes. Have you looked into this? Actually, we didn't do this for the GST covered one, um, but for the like micron sized holes, we actually had even some experimental results on that, which we never published. Um, you can also think about two cavities that are coupled. You can change the distance between them. Uh, the mm -hmm. coupling strengths. So this would be a very nice playground, and it should work. You should. It should be very easily possible to see a coupling there. But um, we haven't continued after my postdocs left. Thanks. Okay, uh, we have another question. Uh, could I ask uh, how you did the simulation in uh, FDTD? Mm -hmm. Did you consider the tip effect? Okay, so this is also an excellent question. Um, considering a tip effect, I could give um, half a lecture. Um, let me just go back to like the simulations. So the simulations did not include the tip um, in, uh, in the case here. Let me just show like this one, for example. So this one was without the tip. And uh, for the um, polaritons that are without this uh, very strong confinement, you see the diameter here was three or six micrometer. And you can think about the tip having only like a tip radius of curvature of like 30 nanometer. So for this particular case, we try to see is there a difference if we use a disturbing or non-disturbing tip and actually the field distribution are very similar, whether you use a metallic tip or a silicon tip. So this means in this case, the tip is only scattering out the light and the excitation comes from the edges of the, of the cavity mainly because of the wave vector mismatch the wave factors of the tips are way too high compared to the wave vector of the polariton. So in this case, we didn't include the tip. And for the other case where you have the high confinement, we also um, um, did not, um, I think in the simulations, the tip was not included um, because if you, if you um, would really get a two dimensional pattern, you would need to take the tip at all the different positions, how it interacts. That said, um, we did some experiments about how the tip interacts with resonators. We did it on metallic resonators, on photon polarton resonators, and we found that once you have this resonator geometry and you have this high Q factor of the polaritons, the tip influence is very, very small in general. Whether or not this is also true for the highly confined polaritons, there are some more detailed studies need to be done. But I assume since uh, you have still a dielectric in between the tip and the polaritons, that uh, these simulations would also give you a very similar value if you would include uh, the tip. Let me go back to the simulations here. Um, no, we didn't show any simulations, right? No, we did not. Maybe there are the bonus slides, let me check. No, this was also the reason why we did not, showed, uh, did not perform the simulations for the latter part, because here the polariton wave vector would be comparable to the tip and could also then distort it. But since the cavities are so small, and since it's a fundamental mode, which maybe the slight asymmetry comes from an influence, but we rather think it's more like that the edge is not perfectly round, and this is where the asymmetry comes from. Otherwise, they're almost, I think, quite symmetric and not too much disturbed. Ah, maybe I have the amplitude and phase images uh, in the backup slide. I hope I still have them. Um, I think they should be, yeah. So this is... Um, different harmonics that show that indeed a single peak is no matter where you do the two omega, three omega, four omega demodulation. And I think there's also amplitude in phase and this looks also like uh, perfectly um, symmetric. Um, yeah, but we didn't do the calculations for the case with the tip. Long answer short. <laughs>
Any other question? Wait a few seconds. Well, if not, uh, uh, we thank uh, you, Thomas, again for the really great talk. Thank you. Uh, with this, we are done. Uh, we hope uh, you will be with us next week for the talk by uh, Alex Parman uh, titled Nonlinear Phonon Polariton Spectroscopy and Microscopy. Note uh, that we have also announced uh, the following uh, three MIDI episodes and uh, through the month of July we will have the pleasure to have uh, with us uh, uh, Jacob Kurgin, Andrea Lu and uh, Kijie Wang. Uh, we have someone who wanted to ask a question. If this person wants to ask a question, we still have time. No? Hello. Hello. Okay. okay. Hello. <laughs> um, Hello and goodbye. <laughs> no questions? Okay. Uh, anyway, details uh, of the talk uh, will be announced uh, on my Twitter account uh, and on the event page on Facebook. If we don't have any other last second question, we thank again uh, Thomas and all the public and uh, we hope to see you, to have you with us next week. Bye. Bye. -bye.